Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're covering the principles of flight in preparation for the CFI check ride. The objective, students should develop knowledge of the elements related to the principles of flight, understand why airplanes are designed a certain way, the forces acting on airplanes and the uses of those forces in flight. The key elements are stability versus maneuverability, the left turning tendencies of the aircraft and load factor. This is the order we're going to cover them in, airfoil design, stability and controllability, turning tendencies, load factor and airplane design and wingtip vortices. Let's get started. Airfoil design. Now let's start with defining a couple of these things. First of all, plan form refers to the shape of the wing uh, as viewed from above. And the plan form, the shape of the wing, kind of dictates uh, the characteristics of your aircraft. The taper of the aircraft refers to the ratio between the wing, uh, the cord, uh, the root cord length and the wing tip cord length. The aspect ratio refers to the ratio between the wing length and its mean cord length, or, uh, re, yeah, mean cord line. And the sweep refers to the angle uh, that the wing is swept back like that. Now, like I said before, your wing shape actually dictates a lot of the aircraft's characteristics. For example, an elliptical wing uh, tends to have better load distribution and reduced induced drag, but it tends to stall all at the same time. Whereas a rectangular wing or a elliptical or uh, not elliptical, uh, tapered wing will tend to stall more at the wing root, giving you more control, you know, out at the ailerons uh, when you're entering a stall. Now, um, a wing with a high aspect ratio, so long and uh, narrow, I guess, uh, will have a more efficient uh, characteristics uh, and reduced induced drag. Uh, but a wing like a swept wing like this is going to be better for supersonic flight or really, really fast flying. So again, the shape of your wing dictates a lot of the characteristics of your aircraft. Uh, so depending on what you need to do, you can have different shape. Move on, on, moving on to stability and controllability and maneuverability. Now, stability just refers to how stable an aircraft is, whether it wants to uh, you know, stay where you put it or whether it's going to divert and uh, if you nudge it and it goes crazy. Now, controllability is how well it responds to your control inputs uh, if you have to muscle it really hard or if it's, you know, super easy to move around. And then maneuverability is the ability to maneuver uh, and, you know, perform. And it's based a lot on the structural strength of the aircraft uh, and the size of its control surfaces. Now, let's talk about static and dynamic stability. Static stability refers to uh, the initial desire of the aircraft to you know, return to stable flight uh, if you nudge it. So for example, if you're flying along and you hit the stick uh, and it kind of oscillates and then settles back to where you originally had it, that is a, a static or a, that is a stable aircraft and has positive static stability. Now, if an aircraft is flying along, you nudge the stick and it oscillates a little and then it settles in a new position like this, that is a uh, that is neutral static stability. And if you nudge the stick and it diverges, it actually gets worse and then diverts, um, you know, controlled flight. That is negative static stability. Of course, we want positive static stability. We want our aircraft to be stable. Uh, st Static stability compared to dynamic stability refers to what initially wants to do, while dynamic stability refers to what it wants to do over time. So over a longer time horizon, what does the aircraft want to do? Does it want to return to where you put it or does it want to diverge? And that is stability, uh, static and dynamic. Now, longitudinal stability is dictated mostly by three things. The center of gravity, where the center of gravity is, the center of lift, and uh, the downward force uh, produced by the tail. Now, uh, you can kind of think of it as a building. If, if your base is nice and wide, uh, the aircraft or the building is going to be uh, more stable. So the further forward your center of gravity is to a limit, of course, the more stable the aircraft will be. Uh, while if you move the center of gravity back closer towards the center of lift, it's going to be a little less stable. That makes sense. As we're flying along, if, uh, if your center of gravity is way back here, it's going to be really hard to recover from a stall because uh, your nose wants to go up rather than, uh, rather than down. Uh, so that's longitudinal stability. Lateral stability refers to uh, how stable the aircraft is in roll. So uh, does it want to return back to straight and level flight when you put it into a rolled, um, uh, rolled attitude? 
And this is heavily affected by things like dihedral. That's the angle between uh, the you know level, uh, the horizon and the wing. So a wing that comes up like this has a high dihedral. Uh, the sweepback angle, like we talked about before, keel effect and weight distribution. Now, a, a wing that has a dihedral, uh, when you roll it into a bank, uh, the aircraft is going to want to side slip like this. And because of the relative wind striking this, the wing like uh at this angle, the lowered wing is actually going to have a higher angle of attack than the higher wing. And so the wing is going to want to roll the aircraft back to a straight and level position or a straight and level attitude. And that is a more stable aircraft, uh, a laterally stable aircraft. Now, uh, as directional stability refers to um, yaw, essentially. Uh, when we're flying along, does the aircraft want to oscillate and then settle back to, you know, straight and level uh, in the direction that you're flying? Or does it want to wobble? Uh, typically, this is, you know, dictated by the size of your vertical stabilizer and uh, the placement of your center of gravity. And so you see um, the aircraft will kind of fishtail. And hopefully, if your aircraft has strong directional stability, it'll stay where you put it. Weak, uh, an aircraft with weak directional stability will tend to um, wobble all over the place. Like the Beechcraft Bonanza, that thing, that thing wobbles like crazy. Now let's talk about the turning tendencies. There are four main turning tendencies we talk about. There's torque effect, the corkscrewing effect of the slipstream, uh, P factor or asymmetric loading of the propeller, and gyroscopic precession. Uh, so let's talk about torque. And first, let me draw my really awesome helicopter here. Now. When you fly a helicopter, the main rotor spins in one direction, let's say that way. Uh, and because of Newton's law of motion that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, the fuselage or the helicopter itself wants to spin in the opposite direction. And so that's why we have our tail rotor here so that we can uh, adjust for that, uh, that, you know, that reaction. Now in our aircraft, our airplane here, uh, the propeller spins in one direction, and because of Newton's law of motion, uh, the airplane wants to roll in the opposite direction uh, of the propeller. And so we have to be prepared to account for that by adding a little bit of aileron pressure. Now, the corkscrewing effect of the slipstream refers to the airflow patterns about the aircraft that eventually strike it on the vertical stabilizer, causing a yawing motion to the left. That yawing motion to the left makes us need to put in a little bit of right rudder. So if you hear your flight instructor yelling at you, right, right rudder, right rudder, that is one of the reasons why. And uh, so, bam, that's that. Now, gyros uh, gyroscopes are governed by two principles. One is rigidity in space, rigidity in space, and the other is uh, precession. We're not really going to cover rigidity in space on this one, so we'll just let's write that out. But precession, if you have a spinning gyroscope, and you apply a force at the center, you know, upward like this. The effective force that what you're, what the gyroscope basically thinks you're doing is pushing here at the rim, at the top of the rim. Now, because of precession, the resultant force, where it actually feels it, is going to be 90 degrees away from where that effective force was. So when you push up or push on the top of that gyroscope, you're going to get a yawing motion uh, to the left, and the. Uh, our propeller is essentially a gyroscope. So if you have uh, a nose down attitude, you're going to feel it 90 degrees away from where the effective force is causing a yawing motion. And then finally, there's P factor, which is asymmetric loading of the propeller. When you are straight and level, the angle of attack of the propeller on the right and left side of the propeller disc is going to be the same. However, if you have a nose high attitude, high angle of attack, the one propeller, the propeller descending, is going to take a bigger chunk of air uh, than the ascending propeller. And because of that, it's going to generate more thrust. So there's more thrust being generated on the right side of the propeller disc than there is on the left side of the propeller disc. And because of that asymmetric thrust, you're going to have a bit of a yawing motion to the left. And that is P factor or asymmetric loading of the propeller. Moving on to load factor. Load factor, or we call them Gs, uh, are, is the ratio of the load the aircraft feels uh, to its weight. And if you've ever been an F-16, you know, yanking and banking, or you've seen Top Gun, when they're like being pulled down into their seat, that is load factor. And 
here is a chart that shows you the, the relationship between the angle of bank in, in level flight, not climbing or descending, at the angle of bank and load factor. And you see the steeper your angle of bank, the greater your load factor is. When you are at a 60 degree angle of a bank, uh, you're going to have a load factor of two. Always. That, that is the relationship between bank angle and load factor. So when you're pulling your steep turns for your check ride, you're going to be feeling, uh, uh, you know, one, one to two G's as you fly around. Now, if you continue to pull hard on the stick or the yoke, you're going to be feeling more and more G's. And you see, it doesn't increase linearly. So be aware of that. You know, the steeper your bank angle, the higher the G factor. And along with that, uh, the more G's you put on the aircraft, the sooner or the faster your stall speed will be. For example, at you know zero degrees angle of bank, uh, your percentage of increase in, in stall speed is going to be zero. If you are at a 60 degree angle of bank, you're experiencing two Gs and the aircraft is feeling two Gs. So it's going to stall 40% higher than its uh, straight and level stall speed. And again, it increases non-linearly. So be aware that the steeper your turn, the higher your stall speed will be, the sooner your aircraft will stall um, compared to straight and level flight. Okay, now moving on, this is your airspeed versus G chart. Let me move this over here. And it is directly related to your airspeed indicator. You see here the green, uh, the green zone, that's your normal operating range. Uh, you can fly between 65 and 180 or so miles per hour, and you can pull up to about 4.4 G, and you can do just about anything in this range, and you'll be fine. Uh, if you pull, you know, if you're at 120 miles an hour and you pull, you know, four Gs, you're going to stall the aircraft. Uh, if you are, you know, flying straight and level and you're flying at 60 miles an hour, you're going to stall the aircraft. Uh, if you are going at 200 miles an hour at, in any attitude, you're going to start bending the, you're in the caution range. If you do anything aggressive at hundred or 200 miles an hour, let's say five G's, you're going to be, you're going to start bending the plane. You're going to get into the structural damage. And then uh, anything in the red zone is going to be structural failure. So to recap, load factor is the, what the aircraft feels like. It is uh, the, the weight that it's feeling uh, based on your maneuvering. And the higher your G loading, the faster you, are stall, you will stall or bend the aircraft. Moving on to wingtip vortices. Now, wingtip vortices are, let me draw my airplane here. When you are flying, the wing, here, let me draw my wing. As air goes over the wing, it is accelerated because it has a longer distance to go. And because of, uh, compared to the lowering, the, below the wing, uh, this accelerated air has a lower pressure compared to the wing, uh, the wind or the air below the wing. Oh my gosh! Um, and because of this pressure differential, that that's generally what generates lift, right? Low pressure, high pressure, the wing rises. Now, because of that high pressure below the wing, the wind, the air wants to come around the wingtip and curl, you know, it wants to go from high pressure to low pressure. So it's going to curl around your wingtip, generating these vor this vortex or these vortices. Uh, and in general, we want to avoid flying into another aircraft's wingtip vortices because, uh, you know, heavier aircraft can roll smaller aircraft like our Cessna 172. Uh, so we want to be careful. And the way we avoid wingtip vortices are by flying above upwind waiting three minutes behind departing or arriving heavies and um, just, just generally avoiding their wake turbulence or their wingtip vortices because they, they can, you know, get us into some trouble. All right. Uh, in conclusion, we covered stability versus maneuverability, left turn tendencies, load factor, airflow design, stability, controllability, turning tendencies, load factor, and wingtip vortices. If you have any questions, if I missed anything, let me know down in the comments. And thanks for watching, guys. See you. Hey guys, welcome back. We're cut. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're covering principles. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're covering the principles of flight in a 